Greetings, travelers. It's me, Nickel Hyper. Welcome to my critique of Logan, the film that wrapped up Wolverine's story. Worry not, a lot of this video will focus on the good parts, which are many. The criticisms I've left for the second half of this review. I know Logan is one of the most beloved comic book films of the 21st century, and I can completely understand why that is. It's because Logan was released in the 21st century. I like Logan a lot. So let me start by giving examples of what this film did well, before I get to the complaining. The Strengths of Logan, Part 1, Directing and Cinematography James Mangold, the director, clearly cares about his craft. Logan's a well-directed film with splendid visuals. Just look at the sky in any of these scenes. It doesn't look like CGI to me, which means Mangold and his team had to wait for the sky to look like that to get these shots. Their patience and passion paid off in my eyes. Some of these shots last fewer than 10 seconds, and I doubt most moviegoers even care about what the sky is like. Then again, maybe I am underestimating audiences. Which is why it's good that James Mangold and the cinematographer John Matheson did not underestimate them. Mangold did a great job directing the action and the somber moments, and Matheson's lighting in Logan is simply superb. The only way to truly appreciate and absorb how fantastic Matheson's use of both natural and artificial light was, is to watch the entire film. No amount of images or clips will do it justice. The Strengths of Logan Part 2 Characters, Blocking and Symbolism I didn't particularly care for Laura when watching Logan, which is a problem I'll address in depth in the second part of this review. Every other major character, though, was near perfectly written. That the performances by Hugh Jackman and Sir Patrick Stewart are world class, I think, goes without saying. Here are a few of my favorite wonderful little details I noticed in the film. Professor Xavier is old as Mesozoic dirt, and feeble as backwards ill beef but he's using his remaining strength and knowledge to take care of plants in his desert dome. Whether he meant the plants to be used for food or seasoning or whatever doesn't matter. To me, this showed that even in a weakened state, Xavier's desire to protect the vulnerable, to be a caregiver, was still there. It was good characterization. Another detail that I loved was that nobody called Logan Wolverine in the super violent opening scene. The first time anyone calls Logan Wolverine happens at a graveyard. Laura's caretaker uses the name, and Logan tells her she's a crazy lady. This symbolizes that Logan believes his heroic side is gone forever, even dead. Logan's claws, once a symbol of his power and awesomeness, are also turned into a symbol of his waning health. It's show-don't-tell done very well. I'm not sure who came up with the idea of having Laura turn the cross at Logan's grave into an X, but they were a genius. Maybe this was from a comic book, maybe it was an original idea specifically for this film. I'm not sure, but it was brilliant. Blocking, an often overlooked part of filmmaking in the superhero and comic book genre, is fantastic in Logan. My favorite example of this is when Logan's being berated by Caliban. The two characters don't see eye to eye at all, and the placement of the actors or characters in this scene emphasizes that. They're sitting in an almost back-to-back -back position during their rather heated discussion. People almost certainly don't sit like this when in a verbal confrontation in real life, but in a scene in a film, it works wonderfully. It would have been easy to have Caliban and Logan sit on opposite sides of the table and yell at each other. 
but that would have shot the fact that they are technically on the same side, or at least in the same metaphorical boat, in the foot. The blocking here clarifies that while they don't agree on how to go about things, they are on the same side, and I am certain this was deliberate. A director that will wait for beautiful skies is not one that leaves character placement up to chance. The Strengths of Logan Part 3 Setups, Payoffs and the Ending Battle I can barely put into words how glad I am that Logan ended with a small-scale battle in the woods. I have liked, or at the very least mildly enjoyed, many a big-budget Marvel movie over the course of the last 14 years, but I often zone out when any of those films reaches its inevitable, over-the-top CGI ending battle. While I wasn't particularly invested emotionally in the fate of these nameless kids, I hugely enjoyed the fight scenes. That is, I enjoyed the fight scenes when I could ignore how incompetent the bad guys appeared to be, but we'll get to that. I appreciated the writers establishing things like the adamantium bullet and the train that enabled Logan, Laura and Xavier to get away ahead of time. It was also wonderful that the gates didn't break open when Logan rammed his limousine into them on the first try. Such a little detail, a minor subversion of action movie cliches, but a most welcome one. So now that I've hopefully shown that Logan is a well-made film in many important ways, and also hopefully clarified that I like the movie more than I dislike it, let's get to the griping. That's the fun stuff. That's the bread and butter of YouTube movie reviewers, or in my case, the coffee and the cookies. Which I hope you, dear viewer, also have access to and will never run out of. The Flaws of Logan, Part 1, Laura, the Clone, and a Missed Opportunity. The character of Laura did not work at all in this film. I will explain why in a second, but to make my larger point, I first need to address the primary threat in the film, the Wolverine clone. When the clone first appeared, I was almost immediately and completely annoyed by the film. Where is the sense of danger or consequence supposed to come from in the subsequent scenes when the main bad guy and the main good guy are identical? Both of them use the same brain dead tactics of going stabby stabby stab 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 and they both also have rapid healing powers. So what's there to be excited about when these two are fighting? There's no way around this problem, in my opinion. The clone and Logan hacking and slashing ad infinitum didn't make for exciting action at all. The Wolverine clone, however, could have served a good story purpose in a way that would have completely made up for that. Allow me to explain by coming back to the character of Laura. Laura lacked personality and had no arc. She was just inconsistent to a degree where it felt contrived. There's a wonderful quiet scene towards the end of the film where Laura says she has hurt people, but only bad ones. And yet, she would have killed the innocent store clerk in cold blood if Logan hadn't stopped her. Perhaps Laura had been so traumatized by her upbringing and by having been on the run for such a long time that she couldn't tell the difference between a mortal enemy and an innocent bystander in the heat of the moment. That's a valid explanation, so I can sort of overlook that moment. Now to the main point. I badly wish that Laura wasn't both a nearly unstoppable killer and, apparently, a person who only hurt bad people. That way, the story could have either A. juxtaposed her innocence and naivety with the Wolverine clone and his mindless killing machine-like nature, or B. used the Wolverine clone as a sign of what she would become without proper guidance from Logan. Either of these would have given the writers a chance to craft a better arc for Logan. I would have liked to have seen Logan start to care for Laura because seeing his clone reminded Logan of his own past and opened his eyes to what Laura's future would become if he himself didn't return from the abyss of indifference and despair to guide her towards something better. We get a scene at the end of the film that aims to show how Laura and Logan have come to care for one another, but that moment wasn't at all earned. Logan died to defend Laura and the other children, and yet I felt like nothing special existed between Logan and Laura. Logan's last line, so that's what it feels like, felt forced. The rest of the film simply didn't establish a strong enough character relationship. Laura was already a good person and an expert fighter, so Logan had nothing to teach her. The scene where Logan stopped Laura from killing the store clerk was the only possible exception, and it was a moment that made very little sense. To sum up, Laura, Logan, and the Wolverine clone all having the same superpowers 
could have been used to create a wonderful arc for Logan and Laura. But because the writers wasted this opportunity, having the three main characters in the film have an identical fighting style was uncreative and boring. The Flaws of Logan Part 2 Useless Antagonists The villains in Logan sucked. There's no reason to use a more eloquent expression here. The villains sucked. Here are the reasons I think so. The second in command guy, Pierce, the one who shows up in Logan's limousine at the beginning, was such a boring and bland character that they actually had to give him a robot arm to make him stand out at all. While it wasn't as bad, it still reminded me of how Darth Maul in The Phantom Menace had no personality, so Lucas gave him a double-bladed lightsaber. Then there's the fact that Laura disposes of all the soldiers or special ops guys or whoever's that are sent to capture her with such ease that there's barely any tension. And to top it all off, Pierce tells his men to stop shooting because Laura heals. Which of course raises two questions. Why did they even bring guns if they're not supposed to shoot those guns? And what was their ultimate strategy for capturing Laura even supposed to be if they showed up with nothing but guns that they weren't supposed to use? I do hate putting it so bluntly, but these villains and this part of the film were both just stupid as hell. It makes little sense to me that Dr. Rice, Pierce, and the rest of the people responsible for the creation of children with superpowers were so ill-equipped to stop those very children. I find it difficult to believe that they wouldn't have had a better contingency plan than to send guys with guns to fight superpowered mutants. The ending of the film also featured the Bad Guy explains his entire motivation and plan for absolutely no reason except to give the protagonist a chance to take him down. Cliché. That's it. We've reached the end of my pointing out the film's weaknesses. Personally, I felt that the film had one more problem, an incredibly depressing overall tone, which went way extreme when the family with the horses got killed. But that's not something I can claim is an actual flaw. Some people enjoy a dark and depressing tone. Heck, I do too sometimes. If I didn't, I wouldn't love Steven Wilson's music. Wow, that was random. In conclusion, Logan is more than a solid film. It's actually pretty damn good. The reason I felt like making this video five years after the film's release, however, was to offer what I felt was some valid criticism. I feel Logan received too little criticism on release and has received very little scrutiny since. It still has a 94% approval rating on Rotten Tomatoes and a place on IMDb's top 250 movies of all time, which implies that Logan was some kind of timeless masterpiece, which I don't think it was. But here's a thought I'd like to end on. Logan didn't need to be perfect, or a timeless masterpiece. It just needed to be a satisfying, well-made send-off to an iconic character and performance. And it was. I wish to thank you for watching this video. Please leave your thoughts in the comments, if you have the time and desire to do so. May you always find great art to enjoy, and may you never run out of coffee and cookies. This thing sucks. <laughs>